Welcome to church. Here at Hope, we're a multicultural family church in Varsity Lakes on the Gold Coast. No matter what you're facing right now, where you're from, or what language you speak, we want to welcome you. We're a home away from home for people all over the world in all walks of life. Our heart is to be the voice of hope in our community, a safe place for people to heal and experience their hope restored. We hope you enjoy this message. I really love that. I feel there's a real expectancy in this place this morning. And I just want to encourage you, before we even dive into the word, expectancy to see God move in your life this morning. You know, whether you've already had that encounter in worship or whether you might have a little bit later today in a conversation with someone. So just be expectant to see God move because he is a living God that is never changing, that is working today. The same that he did in scripture. He's still working today. So before we dive into the Word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for who you are, Jesus. I thank you for your story. I thank you for what you did on the cross. And Lord, we just come to you this morning with our hearts surrendered, regardless of what we've been walking through, regardless of how our week has been, God. I just pray that this morning we lay that all down at your feet and we say, Jesus, have control of our lives. Recenter our focus on you, Jesus so that we can be more like you, that we can hear from your word, that we can change. And I pray this in your precious son's name. Amen. Amen. God's really been uh, challenging me over this last couple of weeks as it's been leading up to my message. And uh, when, I, when I found out that I was asked to, to share something and mom and dad were away, I was like, yes, they're not going to be here for when I do it. So they won't and then I found out they're back. <laughs> so there's a little bit more added pressure, but that's fine. But I really felt like there's been a real shift in our church. And I don't know if you've felt it. I've definitely felt it. Since the beginning of this year, there's been a real desire, a real expectancy to press in deeper to God, press in deeper to His promises, to see revival in our church. And there's been a real sense of the Spirit just stirring and moving. We've been praying every morning together as a church recently. And I just think that God is doing something really special. And it's not just our church, right? There's been that that, that shift across the whole of the Gold Coast, across all of Australia. And I believe that as we come to a time of shift and change where God wants to do something incredible, that the enemy takes as many opportunities as he can to sneak in and to destroy what we're trying to do. And I think the easiest way that he does that is by dividing God's people. So this morning, I really want to share this message that's been burning in my heart about unity. And I'm not just talking about unity as a church. I'm talking about unity between us and Jesus. And I'm talking about unity between us as believers, Because it's so important that we maintain this unity because unity is so powerful. Our world is so divided in almost every single aspect. People are divided into groups based on their identity, their beliefs, what political views they have, what ideologies they carry. And those things divide us so much that we go and attack each other and we're at war with each other if one thing doesn't align. We create these factions and these groups where we tie ourselves to, and we forget the larger picture that we're all human. But there's so much power in the unity that we have as believers. That unity is a shining light for the world. That unity is something only we can have, and it's something so incredible. And so this morning, I really want to just touch upon how we can maintain unity as believers What hinders it? How we can encourage each other? And maybe, just maybe, how we can continue to walk in that unity so that we can be better examples to the world of who Jesus is. So I just want to read out this this verse, and this is going to be my key scripture for this morning. So if you want to follow me, we're in John 17. And let me just paint the picture for you here. So this is Jesus' longest recorded prayer in the Bible. And and it's really important because this happens before he's crucified. And he the, the theologians call this one the farewell prayer. And it's quite interesting when you dig in. And I think that Jesus leaves something so incredible for us today regarding unity. 
And so I want to read it out to you. It out to you. It says that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Isn't that an incredible prayer? Isn't that an incredible prayer? And I love this prayer because it's not just for the moment now. Jesus is looking far beyond that. It's not just what's happening with his disciples. Because if you think about it, there was discourse within the disciples at this point. Jesus had been betrayed. Jesus knew what was coming. And so there's this incredible picture that Jesus paints of he's praying for the now, but he's also praying for the future. He's praying for every single believer that comes after the disciples, after the early church. He's praying for you and me today. And as he says, this line just always gets me, that they be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And the Passion Translation, I really love what it says here. It says, you live fully in me, and now I live fully in them, so that they will experience perfect unity, and the world will be convinced that you have set me, for they will see that you love each other and then with the same passionate love that you have for me. And I really believe, church, that our love needs to emulate, needs to be a replica of the love, of the unity between the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It's so important, so clearly laid out for us right here, that they may be one as you are one with me. And so Jesus paints this picture for us. He gives us the blueprint. And why? Why is unity so important? Well, he leaves us with it, doesn't he? He says, then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That's the purpose. That's the goal of unity. See, the goal of unity is so that we as believers can fulfill our purpose more effectively. And what's our purpose? It's right here. So the world will know that you have sent me to go out to the world and to share the good news of Christ. Our unity has a purpose. It's purpose-driven. And so I want to paint a quick little picture for us. And I'm going to use our worship team example. Wasn't worship so good this morning? Wasn't it incredible? Our team is so gifted. And I really like this idea of how a band works in harmony. So I'm going to point out a couple of things and maybe lift the curtain on some things that you didn't know about. So you you see this little mic over here, church. You may not know what that mic functions as, but we have this role on our music team called an MD. And their job is to make sure that everyone here is in time, (laughs) that's doing the right thing. So if you sometimes maybe will hear the click go really loud out of our earphones, (laughs) That's coming through, and our MD, who is, you know, changes week to week, is also giving us instructions. So if the worship leader wants to go somewhere, the whole band is on the same page. You see, if a band doesn't have the same purpose and doesn't have the same goal, it sounds like chaos. As good as Pete is is playing the keyboard, if Pete was playing out of time from the click and Brian was doing his own thing and Brian was on the drums just playing completely out of time, it would sound terrible. And you would walk straight out of the building. (laughs) The thing is, church, we can get so caught up in what we're doing so often, in what we are doing, in our own talent, in our own goals, in our own purpose, that we miss the larger picture. And just like how a band works, we need God to be the center, God to be our MD, so that He can dictate the flow of where we're going. The one purpose that we have, we need to be united for the one purpose. Otherwise, our message is ineffective. Our testimony is diluted. So when we're bringing the word, it's like a band that's playing out of order, out of in discourse. The song's not going to sound how it should. And in the same way, if we're not united as believers, if we're not united as brothers and sisters in Christ, when we go out and we share the testimony to the world, it's going to be diluted because it doesn't paint the real picture of unity. 
And so I really wanted to identify to us this morning one thing that's really been stirring in my heart that hinders unity. And there are so many things that we could talk about here. We could talk about, we could talk about gossip. We could talk about bitterness. We could talk about jealousy. We could talk about selfishness. There's so many things that can be destructive to that. But I don't want to highlight something that I really believe God has been stirring in my heart this morning. And that is the spirit of comparison. The spirit of comparison. And I really want to highlight this morning because I think that actually is the root of where all of the, the overflow, where that bitterness, enviness, jealousy comes out of is this spirit of comparison. And it's so easy to do that because our world tells us to compare. We live in a world where everyone is comparing with each other. Who has the nicest house? Who has the most money? Who has the most successful career? Who has the most followers on TikTok? It's crazy. Our world gets you to compare, and then it places your value by comparing you to other people. And so we begin to think, even as a church, even as Christians, oh, that person's more gifted than me. Oh, God's using that person in a greater capacity than he's using me. Oh, maybe God doesn't want to really use me for his kingdom. Look at what he's doing in JJ. He can rap. And so it can be so easy for us as times to see the gifting, the talents, and what God is doing in someone else's life and begin to compare ourselves to them. And then, church, that comparison starts to eat into your identity. It starts to eat into who you believe God says you are. And then you become callous, you become jealous, you become envious. Oh, man, why does he get to rap? Why isn't me? And so can I encourage you this morning, church? We were not designed by God to be the same. You were not designed by God to be the same as the person sitting next to you. We are meant to be different. So let me go back to my example that I was sharing about our worship team this morning. I cannot sing well. I can sing, but you won't want to hear it. There's no, there's no pre-show. There's no example. I'm just stating to you that God did not design this body to be a worship leader. <laughs> okay? I was not born with the same vocal talent, the same, you know, training, the skills, those kind of things that I didn't pick up on my journey. That doesn't mean that my role is less important. That doesn't mean that I need to value myself differently from the incredible JJ who can sing like crazy. You know, the moment that we start to want to do what someone else does, we begin to take away the value of what God has called us to do. Come on. The minute that you begin to compare, the minute that you begin to see someone else is more valuable than you, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're bringing down your own value. You guys might not even notice the role of some of the music that gets played on here. Like the bass, what does the bass actually do? (laughs) He does he does like a head tilt and you know he stomps his hand sometimes. But what is he actually doing? The bass is so important, it holds everything together. And the synth is important, right? So they may be playing like one or two notes, but it's holding everything together. And so you're not called to do the same thing as somebody else, you're called to a common purpose. We're called to be encouraging to each other. We're called to work together to go towards one common goal. If I was trying it every week on keys, if I was playing, and I wanted to to, to play what JJ was singing, and Brian was like, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. I'm going to do that too. And then Brian was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that on drums too. It would sound awful. Why? Because we're not in our lane. And this message is not stay in your lane. This message is encouraging you that you have a unique purpose, a unique calling, something that only you can fulfill for God's kingdom. And the moment you begin to compare, your value drops. Don't do that to yourself, church. It's so easy for us to fall into this trap. Your calling, there's no greater one. 
No talent that's greater than the other. We're all for the same purpose. So if we want to cut jealousy, bitterness, resentfulness, selfishness, if we want to cut it at its head, we need to stop comparing with each other and start rejoicing for each other. We need to start encouraging each other and building each other up. And there's this great verse in 1 Corinthians 12, and I'm going to read out a big passage because I think it's important that we read it. It says, The body is not one part but many parts. If the foot should say, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that would not stop it from being a part of the body. If the ear should say, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, that would not stop it from being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, how would it hear? If the whole body were an ear, how would it smell? But God has put all the parts into the body just as he wants to have them. If all the parts were the same, it could not be a body. But now there are many parts, but one body. Many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Some of the parts we think are weak and not important are extremely important. And we take good care of and cover with clothes the parts of the body that look less important. The parts which do not look beautiful have important work to do. The parts that can be seen do not need as much care. God has made the body so more care is given to the part that needs it most. This is so the body will not be divided into parts. All the parts care for each other. If one part of the body suffers, all the body suffers with it. If one part is given special care, the other parts are happy. Isn't that an incredible verse? It lays out so beautifully, not just the functions of our body, but also how we as the body of Christ need to be like. I am not a worship leader. (laughs) If I'm an ear, I don't need to be a hand. But the minute that we begin to compare, the minute that we begin to think that person has it better than me, that person's in the spotlight, they've got more of an anointing, the minute we do that, we bring the value of what we're doing for God straight down. And the enemy wants us to do that because he creeps in and tells you that your value is not enough and your identity is not enough. This morning, church, I want to encourage you that no matter what God has called you to, wherever God has called you to, your role within the body of Christ is just as important as the person sitting next to you, just as important as the pastor standing up on Sunday. No one can replace you in the body of Christ. We're all different because God has called us to work effectively to achieve one purpose. And we need to begin, as it says in the scripture, caring for one another, looking after one another, and rejoicing for each other instead of comparing and tearing each other down. So, where does unity start from? We've looked at how important unity is what Scripture says it looks like. But where does unity start from? Where does re- Really, where does the root of unity start from? And how can we ma- maintain it? Church, unity needs to start between you and God first. It needs to start between you and God. If your walk with God is not right, if your walk with God has been a little bit shaky, it makes it so much more difficult for you to have unity with believers if you're not hearing from God. And let me use our wonderful worship team as an example again. I don't know if you guys know what these little blue boxes here do. These blue boxes are pretty cool. So when we are playing on stage, we can't hear anything, right? You guys hear this wonderful sound at the front, but it's like all muffled mumbo jumbo up here. So what these do is have a little mix for us in our ears. So we've got little headphones that we stick in, and we can hear what each other are playing. If I was to take out Bryant's headphones on a Sunday morning, and he was playing bass, and he was rocking it, but he wasn't in time, and he didn't know where he's going, and he couldn't hear our MD, he would sound really bad. OK? 
okay? As good as he is at what he does, he would sound really bad. Why? Because he's not following a common purpose. The moment that we take away our ability to hear from God, the moment that we begin to starve ourselves off God's word, the moment that we stop having any input into our life that's of any spiritual gain, we begin to lose the purpose because we cannot hear the voice of God. And Pastor Jim touched on this last week. What did he say, church? He said, if you want to hear from God, read the Word. Get into the Word of God. Because the more that we are in tune with God, the more that we can be in tune with the believers. The more that we can be in tune with other and others. If our relationship with God isn't where it should be, we will lack the direction we need to be a part of the body. All right? If my hand was just doing this all morning because it didn't know where it was going, you'd think I was being pretty weird. All right? And in the same way, we really need to maintain our walk with God so that we can be effective when we are unified together as a church, as a believer. So it starts from us, and it needs to overflow into every aspect of our lives. Come on, church. If, if you have, you're saying, all right, Jaden, I'm good with God, I believe. What about your home? Because you can't be here on Sunday, you can't be out on the streets preaching the word of God, and your home be broken. Come on. You can't, you can't be different. You can't be out there preaching how good God is and get home and, and be yelling at your kids or your kids be yelling at mom and dad for what they're doing and not listening. Guys, we need to be united in every area of our lives. It needs to come from overflow. So maybe if you're seeing that in your life, you need to press into God deeper. You need to press into God more. We are here to keep each other accountable, to encourage and build each other up. Do not starve yourself from connection with each other. You're not here to sit in a chair and walk out. You're here to be part of God's church. You're here to be part of his community. You're not here to just come once a year. You're here to be fed. You're here to find believers that are like-minded. You're here to walk together, encourage each other. And if we don't have that church, then we can't be effective when we're reaching people. And if we're not reaching people, we're not doing the purpose. Come on. The purpose isn't to have a nice service on Sunday. I'm sorry. It's not to have the music sound great. It's not for the preaching to be good. It's to go out to our world and share the love of Christ. And if we're not unified in our homes, if we're not unified with each other, then how can we go out and unify the world? And it's so important, church, that all of this unity ties to one purpose. And I don't want you to forget the purpose this morning. Because it can look different, right? The way that you go about facilitating God and the purpose can look different to each other. But we are called for one purpose. And it is so simply laid out to us in our scripture in John 17. It says, Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. That the world will be convinced that you have sent me because they will see that you love each other with the same passionate love that you have for me. We can't lose unity, church. We can't lose unity. We need it. Not just to tie ourselves together, but because it's important when we go out. And if we're too focused on ourselves, if we're too focused on our situation, if we're too focused at looking at the faults in each other, oh, that message was kind of weak this week. Or the worship was kind of flat. Come on, church, you can't go out and do what you're called to do. We need to maintain unity. I'm not saying you have to like everyone in the church. I'm not saying you have to agree and see eye to eye on everything. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying we go for a common goal. You ever had that person at sports carnival that was on your tug-of-war team and they just sit and do nothing? And you're like, bro, just pull, please. Just help a little bit, all right? If we don't maintain unity, it's like pulling for the other team. We're flip-flopping our purpose. We need to be united. And let me, let me just encourage you, church. Just like our worship band and just like an orchestra, 
If you've ever heard an orchestra play, and at the beginning they're tuning, right? And it sounds chaotic and hectic. And it doesn't sound good at all. And they're all professionals. They're all really good at what they do. And they know their score back to front, inside out. They could sight read it. They could do it off the top of their head. I've been practicing for weeks and weeks. And it sounds weird when everyone is going, brrr, tuning, right? But as soon as the conductor walks out, as soon as he raises his hands, harmony. Church, we need to make sure that we are in line with God, that we are listening to His calling, His purpose, so we can be aligned together. Because the moment that we do our own thing, the moment that we listen to somebody else, the moment that we don't follow God, disunity. And it dilutes our testimony. It makes our message to the world diluted. How can you go and say to someone, there is perfect love and hope in Christ, but then come and slander your brother? Or feel jealousy or bitterness in your heart towards another believer, but walk out and say, God is so good, and he loves everyone, and he wants you to be happy and loving, and he wants a perfect life for you. It doesn't work that way, church. We've got to have unity so that we can be effective in our message. And so this morning, I want to leave you with this. And I want to invite the band to come up. Our purpose, our unity, needs to be to go out. It needs to be to go out into the world. We cannot stay in here. What is the purpose of unity if we're building it and we just sit on it within a church? And we might be comfy and we might be happy and we might sing worship and praise, but God has called us for a greater purpose. And it's to go out. And you're thinking, yeah, okay, but that's an evangelist's job. That's not my... No, it's not. We are all called to share the good news. It is the gospel. Evangelism literally means good news. Sharing good news. The unity that we build is for the purpose of going out into the world. It's not to stay sheltered in our church. So I want to encourage you this morning, church. If you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling like there's disunity within your home, within your own walk with God, maybe you have felt bitterness towards someone. Maybe you felt as though God isn't using you in the way that you feel you should be used. Can I just encourage you, church, refocus your attention on Jesus. Come back to his word. Come back to who he says he is in his scripture. Come back to who he says you are, fearfully and wonderfully made, that you have a planned purpose, that there are plans for you that are greater than what you can imagine, to give you hope. And that once we begin to get ourselves right, unified with God, unified with each other, that's when we can really be powerful and effective in the world. That's where we can really do some good work in our communities, in our schools, in our universities, in our workplaces. When we are unified, our message is that much stronger. When the church is divided, our message is diluted. But we can be the difference. It starts with us. So this morning, church, I want to encourage you. And I want us to stand as we spend some time in worship. And I want us to really reflect this morning. Where is your heart at? Have you been walking in a situation where maybe you're feeling as though you've grown a bit bitter, a bit sour? And it's hard, or it's not always easy to identify it in ourselves. But I just want to encourage you this morning recenter your focus on Jesus. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've had a dream. Maybe you've had a passion. You've had a goal and you've had some setbacks. And maybe then that spirit of comparison is dug into you and it's telling you that you can't do what God has called you to do. Church, we're going to break that off this morning. 
Maybe you've been waiting for God to do something in your life for so long that you feel as though your value has decreased. We're going to break that off this morning, church. Maybe you feel as though your calling is, is not as great as somebody else's. We need to break that off our hearts this morning, church. We need to heal our hearts. We need to be unified with God this morning. You need to understand that your purpose is greater than what you can imagine. You need to understand that God has given you a unique desire, a unique talent, a unique calling to reach people that only you can reach. And we need to break off that heaviness over our heart. We need to be unified with each other. We need to build up each other, encourage each other, stand next to each other, fight for each other. Because if we don't, church, how can we go out in the world and fight for them? So th-